saw you and you turned down the whole world's volume and you smile I haven't felt the way for a while and anything I ever felt for anyone just disappeared and you're the kind of girl who makes the decades fly by just like years I got love for you like no one could well maybe I love you more than I should I got love for you Welcome to the Satellites Podcast Live, powered by Rocket Peak Entertainment. Tonight's guests are Joe Lujan, Nicole Gomez Fisher, and Russ Emanuel. Here's your host, Jerry G. Angelo. They mend it. Now we're so close. You finish my sentences. Anything that doesn't have to do with you. That was David Peritiaco, uh, one of my dear friends. He's an incredible lyricist and, and songwriter and singer, performer. And that was a song called You're Something Else. And that's going to be one of the songs that we are launching very soon. Within the next couple of days, we'll have the first images uh, of Helium 3. So everything that I've done as far as a producer, an actor, writer, director, all that good stuff, blah, blah, blah. We are also now doing that with music. And even though music has always been a part of Rocket Pig throughout my career, because music is involved with everything, ever since our, our parents are singing us lullabies or anything. So Helium 3 is about finding the best talent and finding incredible talent and creating with talent and not only providing a, a platform for them to show their work and to, to have their work heard, uh, but to build careers and to give them guidance and to uh, let's let's put us all out there. Uh, it's taken so long to get to this point. Um, but what's happening now is things are growing exponentially day by day, week by week. Things that weren't available to to me or our, our, our company, or our team uh, yesterday are available to us now. And things from today that aren't here, they'll be there tomorrow because of the opportunities that we create Uh creating with positive momentum there's there's so many different it's a, it's a mindset that you do uh at least for myself and i like to share that with with everyone because there's a there there is a formula to to being the best your best self and it's not always you know running off and getting opinions from everybody and, and feeling that you need to do this but it, having the confidence and understanding that through your own struggles and failures and successes and all these things that uh but at some point, we got to give ourselves enough credit that we are enough and that we do have the experience and the know-how on, on what we want and how we want to do it. It doesn't always have to be uh, in, in alignment with everybody else. It's what you want. And when you're helping someone else with their dream, you, you cater to them and you give them everything that you want or anything that they need. And I always say, no matter what position you are on a production or in work or in life uh, or whatever your team that you're on is make yourself irreplaceable. Be so freaking awesome that everyone is going to want you. They're going to call you back. And even though you're working on this production, every single person on this set, you know, or in this workforce are wanting to aspire to be other things, uh, rocket scientists or doctors or whatever it is, but they're not going to forget you because of who you were and your work ethic and, and just what you represent. Um, for myself, uh, you know, it's just natural to want to, to be part of a team. I was the only kid growing up and I had my GI Joes and that's going to be a whole other segment, um, which does play into things. But um, I just want to be part of a team and help make people better. And through my struggles and experiences, because I'm, I'm out there all the time and have been there since I started, you know, out of, you know, just my whole life, I'm just out there and I like to meet people and stuff, but I've met so many people under so many circumstances um, from, from politics to business to to productions and i've been in wars and battles and, and foxholes and bunkers and bombs exploding as far as uh, is trying to get things done and there's there's just some people that you resonate with and there's some people that you don't and you know every all these different personalities and what's important is wherever you wherever you are in your life what's important is to be present no matter all this chaos that's going on is to stop everything and be present. And from this point, you can just move forward and 
be sure that the things that are in your life and the steps that you're taking are what you want. And I always say love, fun, joy, and happiness. And those are my new cardinal directions. I go by that. And then you, as you evolve or you, you can, you can throw in like a Northwest or a Southeast, which is like an adventure or romance and some fun things like that. But as long as you're putting yourself first and taking care of yourself, nurturing yourself, you have enough water, you have enough sunlight, you know, poke holes on the top, you're taken care of. And watch what happens when you get into a position where you're that. It's pretty awesome. Anyway, I want to thank our executive producers here on Satellites. Uh, we, have, uh, we have Bill Arakan, we have Seth, uh, let's see, uh, Mario, and, let's see, that, 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 and Corey, Corey Lolo, Corey Lola, Lolo. There's all these accents on this name, so it's fun. But anyway, if you want to be a part and help contribute to us, uh, to, uh, to Satellites, um, on a weekly basis or on a pledge or donation, sponsorship, any little bit helps. Uh, we are going to expand this to, you know, there's to the rockets, to the stars, all that. There's no, uh, there's no ceiling for us. That's why we are rocket big, rocket big. Just kidding. Okay. So we have some awesome guests. There's a reason why the people that I bring on, there's a strategy to this and it's, uh, it's getting, uh, people that I've got a chance to meet or have been uh, work with directly or through the people that I care or love that have brought other people into my life. Uh, we have Joe Lujan, who is a partner of mine uh, with Rocket Pig. He has Carcass Studios and he's, you know, anyway, we're, we're going to get to meet all these people. We have Nicole Gomez Fisher. Uh, there's Joe right there, writer, director. Um, and we'll get, we'll probably show that again. We have uh, Nicole Gomez Fisher. Uh, I'll just call her Gomez because she's badass. Oh my gosh. I, I don't know if I can get in trouble if I say that. Uh, and then we also have Ross Emanuel. Um, there's a picture of Nicole and Ross Emanuel. Dun, dun, dun. There's Ross. <laughs> He's the one on the left. So uh, in the red. So anyway, thank you for expansion, for producing this. Uh, wait until you see what is happening with expansion. Um, I'll just keep it at that for right now. We're very blessed. Uh, we are getting into television, uh, audiobooks, publishing, action figures, uh, and like I said, Helium Three. So we are we are we are actively working with the next uh, the next up and coming artists and also established ones. So I want to thank Zach Tushan and Aubrey Trujillo uh, for um, helping out in these areas. These are some of uh, these are my bosses. So anyway. Um, with uh, with no further ado, whatever that means, I've heard that said before. We're gonna introduce uh, Joe Luha. Joe Joe Luha, can you hear me? Up. Yeah, I can hear you, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm I'm so excited. I wish I was in Joe's apartment right now, where I spent many nights and <laughs> sleeping on the couch with his cat Leon, who's the, who's the sweetest cat in the world, next to Professor Higgins, of course. But um, anyway, Joe, man, um, thank you for being here. No, man. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Uh, you, you know, I want to. I'd like to have you a, give yourself a quick introduction about uh, about who's Joe Luhan and where you're at. Oh, who's Joe Luhan? Uh, he's nobody. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, honestly, I'm a film director. For those who don't know, my name's Joe Luhan. I'm a film director and writer. Um, I've been uh, doing it for almost 17 years now. Um, I have. Uh, Span of work. I don't. I won't even go through that. There's, yeah. There's a lot of stuff I've done, but uh, I, I guess uh, my most recent stuff is just the Immortal Wars franchise. I have my own comic book series. I have a universe, and I've done the live adaptions. And um, I've, I've been in the industry. I guess for almost ten years professionally, uh, seventeen in total. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to dive into all that I've done because I've done. I've lost count, but yeah, that's pretty much the basics. Yeah. <laughs> and him saying losing count is being modest. Let me tell you, <laughs> how how many feature films have you directed and produced? Oh, um, I will say, well, I'm in the process of a few right now. Um, yeah. But the ones that are released, I think the Immortal Wars Resurgence was my 13th feature. Yeah, that is awesome. And then, of course, you and I just uh, we just wrapped on Obscura. Obscura, yeah, so yeah. I'm really excited for everyone to see what we've done, dude. Yes, so yeah. Uh, so Joe, I just knew Joe was, there's a, there's a poster of Obscura right there. Um, 
And so we started off with uh, Carcass Studios and Road Lizard Productions. And we gained a whole bunch of other on there that have just uh, been very influential and, and uh, momentous in helping us being able to grow uh, the production into yeah, what no, it became. Definitely collaborated with many like, phenomenal, talented people from the cast to the crew to, I mean, even everyone behind the scenes, you know, like that. Well, you know, I mean, it's just there's so many people that literally just did a phenomenal job. And I was just honored to be working alongside everyone. Yeah, that was fun. So I have a lot of uh, a lot of friends and family that are watching and colleagues and we're in the Los Angeles or New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, not a whole bunch of people I know um, in Las Vegas. Can you can you share a little bit about what, what's the atmosphere out there in, uh, in in Las Vegas as being a filmmaker? Because that's pretty much where you've been for your, your entire yeah, career. Yeah, I'm mean, back and forth. I've been doing L.A., Vegas and a lot of stuff in Texas, um, but I've made home here in Vegas as of right now, <laughs> especially with what things are going on right now. <laughs> um, oh, that, yep, yeah, that's me. <laughs> What's that? Tell us about these, uh, these posters right here. Where are you at? Um, so this actually was taken at days of the dead convention. Um, I was a guest there a couple weeks ago, almost a month ago now. Um, and those projects are my most recent, uh, the immortal wars rebirth, um, originally was supposed to be released this month but with things going on with covid we've pushed things back um so we will be releasing that either the end of the year or first thing next year that is the third installment to my franchise and the image under that one was the immortal wars uh, redemption which we start production in the spring of next year that'll be the final installment to my franchise um but yeah like i said those are all what i've been working on the past five years i want to say so sci-fi action um, a lot of the stuff was shot here in Vegas. I, I was one thing that I want to focus on was to just incorporate anyone in the industry here from actors to crew, just, you know, have them add to their resumes and then they can be involved with the project where we're bringing, uh, celebrities in the cast characters who can come in and, um, get that experience. Um, but as far as Vegas, there's a lot of talented people out here. It's, it's insane to see how much talent there is out here. Um, I, I think it's, it's it's fun to see what people are working on, uh, but at the same time, it's kind of like there's so much happening here. It's hard to keep up with everything. Um, but there's lots of talent out here for sure. Who are some of the the celebrities or names that people might uh, recognize that you've uh, brought onto your projects? Um, so within the universe, we've had um, Eric Roberts. He's been in the first two installments, and he's returning for this last final one. Um, we've had Tom Sizemore. He was also in the Immortal Wars. Bill Overs Jr. Uh, Mindy Robinson was in the Immortal Wars. Um, we have a few others that we're talks with right now. You know, we've we've definitely bouncing back from agents to managers and kind of going back and forth. Um, some pretty big names that um, I'm just like excited to hopefully get to get them involved with the universe. Um, I can't Man. say who because I don't want to I don't want to jinx it, but fingers crossed, you know, that we can Man, bring. You up. can't jinx anything, Joe. You're, <laughs> you are you are. <laughs> you're especially you and it it's gonna work out i already you know so don't worry about it i'm praying for all the, it <laughs> all those heebie-jeebies and those black cats crossing your paths and broken mirrors i don't think that pertains to you <laughs> oh here's a great picture billy so, yeah so we'll, we'll say a little bit about this you and i um we're gonna we're teaming up to do uh billy the feature one of the yeah. one of the installments here yeah. Why don't you share a little bit about what Billy is? Not too much, but just enough to scare just the piss out of some people. <laughs> so Billy is, um, I'll start with, I created Billy myself. Um, I made him for a short film that we were just doing for a small little project, um, a series. Um, but it kind of grew. People were very interested. It did very well. Um, it's been doing very well in film festivals. Um, so I decided to make a feature. And Billy is a possessed doll um, that uh, I'm trying to see what to say not to ruin or spoil too much. He just makes you do very bad things to yourself. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question for you. If, if they were in a celebrity death match, Billy and uh, Pinocchio, what would happen to Pinocchio? Uh, Billy would probably not even have to touch Pinocchio and he would still kick his ass. <laughs> oh, or you're not allowed to say ass on here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I have no, the worst. I'm, I'm, I'm going to play with you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know me. I can't like a sailor. It's horrible. Um, but yeah. 
Yeah, no, well, you know, I had the, the pleasure of, of working with Brad Dorff uh, um, okay. many, a handful of years ago in a project called The Control Group. And, I, and, and oh, Brad yeah. Dorff, you guys don't know, is uh, Oscar nom nominator, Oscar winner. Gosh, he did for uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It was a long time ago, but great movie. But he was the voice of Chucky. And so oh, yeah. I grew up being yeah. terrified of Chucky. When I got to meet Joe, and like I said, I like staying the night at his house and sleeping on the couch with uh, Leon, the sweetest cat in the world. Um, <laughs> there's this doll, Billy, that we, we, I'd say, hey, bring out the doll, bring out the doll. And the cat <laughs> would just like just disappear into its little, his little pyramid, like he sleeping he headquarters. He's terrified of it. He is. He hates it. Every time he sees him, he's hissing at the doll. Yeah. I actually don't like it in my place. I, I leave it in storage and I put them away. I don't feel comfortable. With it yeah, being, it's pretty. It's pretty. Intense. Even though it's but, fake, it still messes with you mentally. So it's like, nah, it's, stay outside. <laughs> and so, so everyone knows, Joe is a writer, a screenwriter, a producer, a director. Um, you've done some acting, um, yeah. you, and you've created a, a, a like like Marvel in the DC yeah. comics. There's an entire world that the like uh, Stan Lee. So Joe Luhan has done the same thing. He has. How many characters do you have in your universe? Um, the universe is hitting. I'm constantly adding new stuff um, with all the installments, but I think I'm at 137 characters right now in the universe. 137? 137, yeah. 37 is a great number, by the way. Yeah. My mom was born in 37. So, oh, wow. but, yeah. um, so that comes to mind. But uh, yes, and uh, I get to play one of the characters. Can you tell them a little bit yeah. about the project and the character? Yeah, that I play? Uh, there, so th there you go. Hellion. Hellion is actually um, a character that I'm introducing right now because he's a character in the last installment of the Immortal Wars. So this is kind of like his origin story. Um, and it's a, it's a, for those who don't know, Obscura is actually part of the franchise, the whole universe as well. So Obscura is the origin to the origin story of Hellion. And we kind of see where that character um, that obviously is played by you. And he he's kind of introduced this whole universe. And I can't say any more because I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. That's okay. And yeah. Obscura is actually also one of the creatures that, that crosses yeah. over into your universe. And what's fun is that we work together and he and he we 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 each aid to each other in creating these different universes and, and the characters and um in the creating of obscura we created a biker unit that's going to be in a in a military unit that also gets the crossover so it's you know it's infinite what allows it is for us to be able to have you know to, to have no ceiling over the creativity of what we're wanting to do you yeah. don't have to be a major studio no. um to be to be having fun, doing what you love. And like I said, Joe is a perfect example for all independent filmmakers and all filmmakers in general is to go out and you can do it yourself. You got to do it yourself. You don't want to wait for people. Um, yeah. Actually, it's it's true when you say that. I, I, I'll i say that it was always a dream of mine to be involved with a Marvel film. That was always like the the point I wanted to get to. Um, and, and uh, let's be honest, it's very hard to get to that point, especially in this industry. It's so saturated with so many ta like talented individuals that it, it, it's almost feels almost nearly impossible. So that's when I decided, you know what, why wait? Let's just, if I have everything in my hands, why not just create my own universe? And I started building it and it started coming to life and I didn't wait for it to happen. I made it happen is what I did. So let's, let's go back in our little time machine and we start off and where where did you start to learn how how young were you that you felt that were the first aspects or informations of your life that started to influence you that led to you becoming a filmmaker does that um, make sense yeah um i mean it started so when i was younger my parents never let me watch horror films i wasn't allowed to um so my grandmother and my older sister, when they would babysit us, they would have me walk. They would be like, hey, don't tell your parents. That's, we're going to watch these scary movies. And those were Scream and I Know Which Day Last Summer. So that that fascination of the way Wes Craven and, and the creators were just creating these worlds that just watching you feel like you're a part of, in a way, you start, you start to feel like you're involved with that. That's what intrigued me at first. And then I started getting into all the technical stuff. Like, I love the lighting. I like the cameras. I, all that started growing. Um, but I hadn't decided I was going to be a filmmaker yet. I was actually going to go to school for, to be a veterinarian. That's what I was going to do with my life. Wow. I, I love animals. So that was like my 
mindset, I'm gonna be a veterinarian. But then I saw Resident Evil, the first Resident Evil movie, um, and I was already obsessed with the game, so that all shifted. After I saw those role credits, that changed my life. I was like, I'm gonna be a filmmaker, I'm gonna make films, and I've just, yeah. The thing with me is, I, I don't like to say just one thing inspired me or intrigued me. I, I like all types of art, so I appreciate anything that's created. I I know what's ta- what it takes to finish a project, to 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 work and put your entire life. You even sacrifice your health. You, us as filmmakers, we don't think of anything else other than what the finished product has to be and what we've envisioned. So, anything that's completed to me is an accomplishment, and I congratulate anyone who's finished anything as far as. Uh, arts, music, a song, a, a short film, music video, a feature film, anything. And I appreciate it. And to me, I'm like, that's what kind of makes me more intrigued to continue to create and to be, uh, I mean, even as, being involved with the film festival, if you're screening along other artists, it's just an honor to be right next to these guys who have basically done everything they can to finish a product. So I've kind of stuck to that mindset for years now, you know. Yeah, and you know what? With you saying that, I want to say this is very important for all, everyone. Um, it, it's it's so easy to put out negative energy or to or to to down a project or something you hate and to say, "Oh, that was shitty," or or you didn't like something. And um, the further I got along in my career and, and start putting stuff out there, I realized that I didn't want to do that anymore because, um, you know an approach that I like to take is like, if there's something you don't like, instead of putting, you know, saying that and all that, it's just like, you know, I'm not the right audience for it and kind of exactly. getting it to leave it at that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've come to realize that you, there's no way you can please everyone. And nowadays the people think so critically from finished product that nothing pleases anyone anymore. So it's like, why even, why even care about it? As long as you believe in your project, you love what you're doing and you're dedicated and you're happy, then that's all that matters. Who cares about all the negativity, the people who are talking crap or, uh, I don't know, uh, critics, people who review films. I think it's ridiculous that people review films and then they go in, the whole review's negative. It's like, yeah. so you sat there just to dissect a project to pull out the negativity? Like, how do you sleep at night? You know what I mean? To me, it's just like, yeah. why do that? Just enjoy the project, appreciate what it is and move on with your life. <laughs> that's the way I see to- This topic came up, uh- Last week, when we were talking with Robert Lasardo and Tyler Gallant um, from Obscura, and, and uh, Marcel was another director. Um, you might know him, but anyway, we're yeah. talking yeah. about this, too, and how we deal with it. How do you deal, you know, um, what was some of the evolution of you dealing when you first found out when people would, would bash on your stuff? Because there's no way around it. No matter um, if your God came down and made a movie, people would yeah. bash. I'll be honest. I did, a, I did do the mistake of when the first Immortal Wars came out, I went to go look at the reviews. I did the mistake of going to look at them and people were butchering me. I mean, people were just, it was bad. They were being nasty. They were talking very bad. And it put me into this horrible slump. I was like, it was bad. It took me off my groove. I was like messed up for, a, I, I want to say about a week. But after that, it kind of I sat there and I'm like, no, you know what? Like, I know what I put into this project. I'm proud of it. I think it's the best that I could do at that point. No, I think I, I kind of see it as like, could you do what I did? Like, can you actually finish a project like this and do it better? You know, to me, that's kind of what got me going. Since then, I don't even bother. I mean, I still get crap from certain things I make. I know I was making, uh, before I started with the sci-fi action, I was doing a lot of horror films. I was doing a lot of stuff that not many people like, uh, as far as, like, torture or or people getting killed on, on camera, stuff like that. Not real, fake. But you should have seen the messages I was getting, man. I was getting stuff like, they're praying for me that I need to find God that people are saying like, I bet he sleeps like upside down and he bathes in blood. I was getting the most insane messages. It was insane. I'm just like, dude, like if ever, if anyone knew, I was like, I'm the most religious person you could think of. It's just, it's my business, you know? So I, the way I deal with it, I just, I don't even, I don't bother. I really don't bother. I, and that's, and that's important. It's just to let it yeah. get just kind of this kind of like tink off of you like Superman. Yeah. You know, yeah, well, it really doesn't phase me when people talk bad about the projects or if they have negative things to say. I'm like, okay, well, let's see if you can do better or let's see what you can do. You know, just like yeah, whatever. And so, with that said, now we got that part out, the 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 cock up part. Um, what do you say? Uh, what are some of the the highlights and what are some of the reasons that that just continue to motivate you when you, the good, the praises, the successes? Tell us about 
those things and how powerful they are and how how you uh, take those in? Um, it it's gonna be a little. I mean, I'll, I'll just say it the way I feel. It's like it was always every when I was a kid, I was always dreaming. I was always dreaming of having my own films in stores. I mean, every time I'd go to Walmart or Target, the first place I would go would be the entertainment section just to see what was out, to see those films on the shelves. So when the first Immortal Wars came out, that that experience, I walked in by myself to a Walmart. I walked to the entertainment section, and my movie was like right next to a Marvel film. To me, that was like all the negativity, all of the the the, the tears and the stress and all of the, the sleepless nights, it all went away. I was done. I was like, this is holding this product in my hand, knowing that I worked very hard and people believed in me and, and backed this project. To me, that's what made it all worth it. To me, that's the, the obviously in this industry, we have to think of returns and, and money and, and stuff like that. But to me, that was the payment. To me, seeing the finished product on the shelves, that was like, okay, I, I felt like the richest guy in the world, just the fact that I had that product in my hand and the public can go and buy the film. So to me, that was the, that's the one thing that gets me motivated. It's like just that, that feeling, that gratitude, that, that, I don't know, that energy when you feel like you finish a product and it's in the hands of the world, they can enjoy it. Once again, not everyone's going to enjoy it. But since, since then, I've kind of just been going at it nonstop. Yeah, that's the way I go with it. One of the <laughs> Excel Sear. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> That's like that's like one of those punches when you go punch and you get a knocked out. Um, I do want to say um, you are also uh, into music as well, and uh, one of your business partners um, have all you. I think you're involved. I'd like you to explain a little bit, but Chris Ivan, who's also a very dear friend of mine, he just released a, an album um, recently. Yeah. Uh, Friday, last couple yeah. of days, sure. and I, I I have I have two copies of it. Um, will you uh, share a little bit of your experience from in the music sense? Yeah. And, and, uh, so and the album. Yeah, no. Uh, so music was never a plan. <laughs> it was never going to happen. To me, I didn't have an urge or anything like that to be involved with it. It was just film and, and my comic books and all that. But it was, um, so I'll make the story very short. So um, I was already working with him because I was shooting his music videos. Um, we, we wanted to collaborate and I, I signed on to direct his music videos and I lost my grandmother on Christmas day last year. And in the process of him writing a song for the new music video that we were going to go for, he ended up writing lyrics and completely reconfigured the entire song and to, as a tribute to my grandmother. And he was like, I've heard you sing and I want you on this track and, and I want you to come in and sing this verse. And it was just like a, it was, it was very like, I was held back a little bit when it first happened. Um, but believe it or not, when it came to music, uh, yeah, that's his album. It comes out on the 27th. It comes out in a few weeks. It'll be worldwide. It's being released. So I'm really excited and proud of him. He did such a phenomenal job. Um, and then we we started recording. I started recording and trying to deal with everything when my grandma passed. I had no other way of dealing with it, especially with being on my own. You know, I live on my own out here. All my family's back home in Texas. It was kind of that outlet of how am I going to deal with this? So the music ended up I found like it very therapeutic. I was able to release everything I felt and then it grew. Then I started directing more music videos. Um, he pulled me on another track, uh, another track called um, Beautiful Warriors, um, which is like an anthem just for equality and, and freedom. And, and um, after that, I just kind of started getting hooked on it. It's kind of like my, my escape from the craziness of all the film life and film work that I do. Um, and I've worked with him. I be I signed on as the executive producer to his album, and I'm directing all of his music videos. I am actually directing and shooting his entire visual album, which we'll be releasing next year. So we've been working very close with um, with Chris. Yeah, he's, he's a explain a little bit about the visual album real quick because you're in the in the now and current and. Um, you got uh, like Beyonce is doing the same thing or she did the same thing, right? The same thing. Yeah. With black is King. Yeah. So we're basically shooting music videos for every track on the album. And then we're shooting a film that is connecting each music video together. So when you sit down, you can watch almost a feature film, but basically that's kind of what we're doing with the visual album. And he'll be releasing it within a, I think it's like a, 
like a deluxe deluxe edition of the album. There you go. There, yeah. So that's the album. Uh, very proud of him. He's done such a phenomenal job, and I was honored just to even be creating this his visual album and working with him. And it's been a long time coming. He's worked three years on the album, so it's exciting to finally. I had the honor to listen to the entire album and get one of the first copies before anyone else. So it was. I'm excited for everyone to hear what he's what he's going to be releasing. Yeah. Cool. Check that out. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I worked with him on creating the artwork as well. So he had a photographer, Kyle, he did all the photography and I jumped on to design all the text and do the back. And yeah, I designed that for him. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, and you're going to be directing a lot of stuff here also with helium three. Uh, working yeah. with, uh, I'm, game. I'm there. Yes, I will yeah. do it. <laughs> so cool. Well, we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be bringing on. We have two other guests that we're gonna be bring on our show uh, with satellites. Uh, we have Nicole Gomez Fisher and Russ Emanuel who'll be coming on um, shortly after that. But we're gonna get to meet Nicole uh, Gomez. I, I call her Gomez. Where's Gomez? Um, <laughs> let's see. Da, 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 da. Can you hear me, uh, Nicole? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So, uh, so thank you for coming on all the way in New York. I know it's later out there. And uh, so uh, Nicole is a, is a dear friend of mine for many years. And, uh, and so she's a, a writer director as well. She does a lot of other things. And I'd like the two of you guys to say hi real quick and introduce each other yourselves and say hi before we get started. <laughs> hi. Hi, <Joe. laughs> hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I feel like we're on a dating site. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. You'll be invited to the wedding, Jerry. <laughs> oh, wow, gosh. All right. Like, you get, In I don't know what to say. I'm so delighted. Thanks. <laughs> as long as there's food, I'll be there. <laughs> of course you will. It'll definitely be food, yeah. So <laughs> Nicole is is quite quite a uh, – she's a she's a pillar. I would say you're a, you're a pillar. You're – you're a mom. You have you have how many kids? Twins, four year old twins. So they, but they twins basically are multiplied. So it's like a little exponential, like helium three. There's a little number to the side to where they're actually worth like there are a whole bunch of Tasmanian devils running around, right? Yeah, basically. <laughs> how is that? How does that affect your life being a full time filmmaker? Give us a. How hard is it to to be you and get follow your <laughs> dreams still being a parent? Um, it's it does lend itself to a lot more difficulty. I mean, you have to really find the time and balance and manage, and of course, reach out to any resource you can for help. Um, I haven't been on set since the kids were born. Actually, that's not true. I was on set, but I actually had people at the time that were able to help me. And as long as you have family and other resources to help you, you just have to carve out those times. And with COVID, it really put a halt to a lot for me as it has for a lot of other people because at the end of the day, the kids are not in school, they're home, they're 24 seven. So I, I went about and hired somebody to help me. You know, um, It's the only way to work with having my husband at home, having the kids at home, and then just trying to find some sort of safe space. Um, <laughs> I hate saying that, but you know, the safe space to find yourself some time. And there's times where I, I can't do anything until they go to bed. And once they're in bed, I'll pull it all night or just to finish the writing assignment or whatever I'm handling just to balance. It's all about balancing. And it's all about really wanting something and desire. You know, if you don't have the real motivation and uh, and the guts to push forward, because as Joe said, it's really about living your dream, doing what you want to do for yourself. And Hollywood, you know, you don't carve that road for yourself. And if you don't have that desire then it becomes an impossible task. It's hard, but it's doable. So Joe's <laughs> over there in Las Vegas. And mm -hmm. you are, oh, where exactly are you? What city? I'm in Brooklyn, New York. But all what? <laughs> <laughs> Brooklyn's in the house. Uh, uh, always has I, been. I, uh, I spent, I lived in New York for a little bit of time. And mm -hmm. I was a filmmaker, you know, did stuff out there in New York, uh, mm -hmm. Williamsburg. Oh yeah. And oh my gosh, uh, New York is a beast. It's a beast, especially coming from the West Coast and New Mexico. Um, <laughs> I, I felt like in the time that I was there, 
you know, I lived you know, every every month you're there is basically a year if you're you know if you're uh, <laughs> step you're putting your foot on the gas. Can you uh, can you explain to us what it's what's what's New York like as a filmmaker? Um, I think there's in some ways more opportunities. Um, I think because we're not sort of crowded and clouded by the Hollywood way, it allows us more opportunity to just sort of go. But at the same time, everything here is about resources and knowing the right people. And I don't mean Hollywood people, I mean owners of diners, owners of nightclubs, places that you wanna shoot and get things at discounted prices. Um, Everyone says in order to make it, you have to be in Los Angeles. And I absolutely disagree with that. I think as long as you're doing the work and producing good work that you're proud of, it's either going to come to you or it's not depending on, you know, I know a lot of people in Hollywood and it is not necessarily, <laughs> uh, it's not necessarily always the in that you're looking for. Um, in New York, it's, it's, it's fast paced. I mean, it's, you know, no one has time for BS. Everybody is on the go 24 seven, but since COVID, things have really slowed down. I don't just mean in the entertainment business. I mean, as far as people being more open to allowing you spaces to work in and so forth, there's just much more opportunity, believe it or not, for independent filmmakers now than there was before, even with the COVID rules and regulations that the unions have put together. So as hard as it can be, there's something about the energy here that just gets you going. There's so much madness. There's so much fast pace. Nobody has time to, to have a million. <laughs> yes, I don't sleep wherever Liberty Radio is. <laughs> There's no sleep in Brooklyn. Um, but the bottom line is, is I think uh, it's just a different world. And I think because you're not being bombarded by all the what not to do, what to do, the Hollywood way, it, you just sort of have more mental freedom to sort of create and do without feeling like, like what you said, Joe, I mean, you, you really nailed it on the head. It's about having the passion to do something, no matter where you are, whether you're in Oklahoma or Puerto Rico or wherever you are, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, if you have that drive, you can get things done. And I think it's very easy to get boggled down. Um, and from my experience of living in Los Angeles, it's very easy to get boggled down by what everybody else wants and what's going to appease them and what's more marketable. And like you said, Joe, of course you want to make the returns. Of course you want to put money back in people's pockets, if not your own. But at the end of the day, it's about putting out the quality of work that you wanna be proud of. And I felt like when I was living in Los Angeles, I was held back because I was so insecure and so conscious, even as a director of my weight and things that just didn't even matter. You know, just the most minute things, I always felt there was negative competition. In New York, for some reason, there's tons of competition, but I feel like there's more camaraderie I feel like people want to come on and help you, whether they're working for free or they're working for food or what have you. And it's, you know, again, having been raised here and born here, I, my resources are plenty. You know, there's more for me to do and more people to contact to connect my dots than there were when I was in Los Angeles. But that's just really about being born here versus there. Um, I just love the New York energy. You know, it's, it's no nonsense, it's cutthroat and, um, I'd rather have honest criticism than just, I can't kind of say BS. I don't want to say any bad words. You said we couldn't say ASS. I sell my you can curses. say whatever you want. It's fine. I sell my curses with my four year olds. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it, it's just, a, it's different. Um, I would love to eventually get my work out towards the West Coast and, and use, because uh, some of the actors out there are people I want to work with. But everything is baby steps. You know, I've had major highs and major lows. And just like Joe said, I try to stay away from uh, reviews because I think they're incredibly uh, damaging to one's ego and sense of self. And you lose sight. I've had people on my first film that just castrated me and, and had everything you could possibly say and killed the past. And these are Emmy winners, Golden Globe winners, Tony winners. And they, were, they weren't well known in the Hollywood sense at the time. But now they are. <laughs> but at the time, and people would just crush on them. And I'm like, if you only knew the money that was put behind this and looked at the production value, and I was always trying to prove myself and say, but you don't understand. And you don't know what I did in the 17 hour. Nobody cares. At the end of the day, we have this wonderful thing called social media, and people will take to it and destroy you and call themselves film critics. And sadly, other people jump on that bandwagon, and you just have to sort of block it.
and just remember what you're doing and why you're doing it. You were talking about the highs and lows, and that keeps the. What, what, tell us about this picture real quick. What's this? Uh, Thirty pounds ago, I'm blonde. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, wow. Uh, six years ago, um, I won the Amahan Award, which is like the Latino Golden Globes, I guess. I mean, I don't know, Emmys, whatever. I'm just I'm hyping it up. But um, <laughs> it's a it's a great um, place to be recognized, and I won Best Director for my first feature. And uh, it was an exciting time. That's me with my husband and Ana Ortiz, who played uh, one of the roles, uh, one of the lead roles in the film. Very gracious actress, very honest, very warm, very real. And I hate saying real because it's what's not, you know, these days everything's fake. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, that was after the win. And as you can see, there's a lot of empty chairs there because it was like a 17 hour ceremony. <laughs> people were so tired by the time I won my award, but I didn't care. Um, and uh, it was a really fun moment. And just at that point, it was like the pinnacle of pinnacles, at least for me, having done my first feature film. And, you know, things kind of went this way and then went that way. Well, here's, here's the thing. It's uh, life and career and all these things is, is like a heartbeat on the monitor. That's how I look at it. Or stocks. You know, nothing just goes up and not everything goes down, you know, it, it goes up and down. It's, it's a, it's a lively thing. I think the goal and, and just knowing that, just accepting that is to try to, you know, <laughs> gradually we want to do is, is continue to, to climb upward. And if we, on the times that we're starting to come down or starting to feel something coming down is to acknowledge it first. And so that we can um, put some energy in, into stopping, you know, stopping the downfall or whatever that is in our lives. It's something I kind of I learned over the last I'd say maybe two years or so, and 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 in learning to be able to acknowledge, you know, when you're feeling low or down, is to to stop, you know, that momentum and take you know try to get neutral and start to build things into yourself that are positive things you love, even if it's just petting, you know, Professor Higgins, my cat, or just things that are just instantly. Um, just good energy, you know, and I really, I keep always saying about energy because at least for me and my experience, and I've seen how, how energy in a set or energy in a restaurant or energy, whatever, you know, can bring you up and can bring you down. However, and it's not always reacting to what the outside world gives to you. It's, it's being able to keep this furnace inside us burning at all times. Mm -hmm. And it's in, in keeping, it doesn't have to be all, you know, flipping in the air and stuff and, and you know, and celebrating all the time. But it's it's keeping a, you know, just being aware of where you're at, and there's no reason why you can't have all that. Anyway, that's a whole. No, it's it's true though. I mean, I look at you know, Joe. I went on and looked at your IMDb page, and I was like, oh my god, like how do <laughs> I don't want to follow that. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's amazing to me. I I actually have a friend who's a screenwriter. She's not a filmmaker, and she's one so many huge awards for her screenwriting. And to this day, she still can't get an agent or manager. And I just think it's one of those things where you learn to not depend on that. You learn to say, just again, Joe, sorry to keep praising you, but to just sort of get past all that and, and just focus on what you can do. And it doesn't mean it's easy because of course there's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of people that are relying on you as a director and producer to get that money up front and to to live up to you know your contractual obligations. and there's a lot of red tape that's involved. And I think it's very admirable, Joe, when you look at someone's IMDP page like yours and you're just like, holy S-H-I-T. Um, <laughs> you, know, you, you have so many under your belt that a lot of people, there's no way to deny your passion, your talent. And people don't see that because they only see what they want to see in Hollywood, you know? And, and it, they're always comparing you. They're always comparing you to others. Yeah. Well, Here's a point said, I want to make, yeah. Nicole, with what you just said. You said your friend can't get an agent or a manager. Okay. No. Was it was it an agent or manager that, that made it possible for you to make your film? Nope. <laughs> Joe, I still don't have one. <laughs> Joe, out of out of your 13 or 14 feature films, was it a manager or agent right. that um that made it possible for you to make any of those? No, I, I did it all down. I got signed after all that happened. So yeah. Right. Exactly. And, and it, still, it, doesn't, it doesn't dictate whether you're going to make your next project or not, right? No. no okay. If, if they contribute and open up a door that allows you to get onto another project, something that's great. But you're the driving force. I've produced, yeah. uh, I think, 13 feature films now 
and, and, and a whole bunch of other, you know, other things. And it's never been an agent or a manager that has, no. um, that has dictated or, you know, said I could or couldn't do any of those things. It's been myself. So, right. you know, for anyone who does want to create, pay attention to that. You don't have to wait for anybody. No. Um, so anyway, with all this said, um, we're going to be getting on our, our other, uh, our friend here. I'm excited to introduce Russ Emanuel to you guys. So um, Russ Emanuel has, uh, has taken a, a unique approach as well. And he's done a lot of short films as well. And he gets nice budgets on these things. And he goes through SAG. He just finished one up. We're going to get a chance here to, to talk to, to Russ. Um, where I think there's a couple Russ? of film festivals there. <laughs> wow. Okay. Russ. Hi. How you doing? I, I, I didn't pick that photo. <laughs> what, tell, no, it's, what was it's the impressive. photo? What was this? Oh, what's photo? that? Tell us about it. Oh, that, that this just uh, you know, it's it, I I put these photos up on Facebook to just um, get get the people that you know contributed to the projects or you know just for publicity. That that's why I do that. So yeah, but I I did not submit that photo to be put up there on your show. Why why well, why is it important for you to put up? Uh put up pictures up on social media of people that supported you because they need to know that there's momentum uh with my projects and you know that's one way to show it um that's how i was able to get the investment on the 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 project that you were talking about that i just shot last weekend um it just there's a group of people and you know i i think they like to see that you know things are happening and it's still happening uh, on a regular basis and that that's why I do that so tell us a little bit about the project you're you just you just wrapped on um tell us about the give us an a through z um kind of a of, of who's it who was involved with it here's a picture here can you talk about this yeah it's just a teaser you know it's not an official poster or anything uh you know I, I just put it up on the imdb so you know it just shows an image of the uh the production um and you know we um so I, I started the project with my filmmaking partner emil harris uh probably i don't know maybe five months ago or so and basically up to this point in my career i've you know done several features not not as much as uh joe here but i've done you know maybe just a <laughs> couple um and you know one of them actually two of them have been doing quite well, especially on the festival circuit um, and even in distribution. So, um, you know, I, I seem to uh, got to the point where I'm directing Star Trek actors. And, you know, a lot of my investors are, you know, fans of Star Trek. And, um, you know, when I sold this uh, project, it's like a zombie horror. Um, and it's right now a short, but it's really just, kind of like the beginning part of it. Uh, it's not really a short, it, it's not even a concept piece. Um, but, you know, um, the way I sold it to my investors is like, uh, there's not a lot of content happening right now because of COVID, um, you know, and, you know, there was this one film that I watched on Shudder called Host, and I, maybe some of you have seen it, but it's only 56 minutes long and it did really well on shutter anyway that's what that's how i sold it um because that horror makes money um you know unlike <laughs> you know some of the other genres horror is like one of the one of the exception to the rule you know it could be 80 minutes or 75 and i guess in the case of host 56 so you know i was kind of selling it that way so we were able to raise the funds that way and um I was very fortunate to, you know, have my friend, uh, his name is Sean Kenny. He was the uh, original crippled Captain Pike on the Star Trek original series <laughs> back in 66, I think, 1966. So, you know, he was on the project. And because he was on there and because of one of my investors, we were able to get Olivia Dabo. Uh, she was in Conan. Was it Conan the Destroyer, I think? The second one? Uh, she was in an episode of Star Trek. She was in The Rise of Skywalker. She had a vocal cameo, uh, you know, as one of the voices of the Jedi past. So, you know, I was selling 
uh, the project that way. You know, we're going to have these uh, people on, on board the project. We can reach out to Star Trek fans and Star Wars fans. Um, and it's a zombie horror. And uh, we were able to get a proper budget. So, you know, we had the thousand dollar special makeup effects for the zombie, you know, the prosthetics. It was actual prosthetics. It was a three hour makeup. Um, and, you know, we had the right lens package. We had rain gags. We had light gags. Um, just, I just threw everything at it, you know, just to make it as, you know, professional as possible. Including, including COVID protocols. Uh, yeah, that, that was interesting. Uh, COVID compliance officer. Yeah, that, that was uh, quite expensive. <laughs> uh, we should, I mean, I mean, you may know we shot at a place. Yeah, there, there you are. There, there's Bill Victor. Hi, Bill. <laughs> yeah, we Bill's had to wear masks. Um, you know, be, be, we had to do COVID tests before. Had to be PCR DNA and or rapid molecular tests. Um, you know, it, because uh, we had SAG actors. So because of SAG, they were very strict with the protocol. Um, and how much? We had how much to, did it cost to have to? just for COVID on your project, roughly, how much did you have to allocate for uh, just COVID uh, related um, procedures, items? Uh, one six of the budget. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good to know. Yeah. It, I was, wanted, it uh, was, it was expensive. Yeah. Can, can you share a little bit about what shutter is and how you got your project on shutter? And you know, I, I, I didn't get it on shutter. No, no, no. I'm oh, just saying yeah. that's how I sold it to that, That's how I sold the concept to the investors that we would approach a place like shutter um, based on because they gotcha. are starving for content right now due to the COVID restrictions. And I guess gotcha. my film was a case in point. I mean, look, the, it, it did cost one, one six of the budget just to deal with COVID. It, it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, um, can I interject for uh, one second, Russ? Yeah. Jerry, is that okay? Can you what? Can I interject for one second? I was just gonna follow up on what Russ just said. Oh yeah, go you guys you guys jump in at any point. Let's well, uh let's do this. I was just gonna tell you that I'm actually in the process of redoing a budget that I had done last year. And because Real, of COVID, hold, my but yeah. Real quick, there's a a sound it's a little strange. I don't know if you're you did something uh, different. Shoulder. I change, I put different earbuds in. You can't hear. Um. Is it? You're, you're sorry. Hold on. I'm just gonna take them out. Fingers cross like you're a robot. Is that hard. better? Is that better? That's still can you hear safe. me? <clears throat> Hold on. I can hear you. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Real quick. Hey, Russ. Uh, Joe Luhan, um, who's one of my partners. He Joe's. <clears throat> effects across yeah can the you hear board. me he's been doing it except full distribution and stuff and so the two of you guys need to, to connect because uh he can enhance anything that you have uh any anything that you have um he has so much experience it'd be good to yeah to i've learned I've, i learned i ended up learning doing bfx just on my own <laughs> thank you youtube because youtube helped me a lot but i've been able to expand uh my creativity with VFX and, and CGI for projects. Nice. Um, so any of the stuff you see in the Immortal Wars and stuff, I ended up doing all the VFX myself. Nice. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Saved lots of money for sure. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I, just, I don't want to interject, Ross. I just want to make that point. Yeah, that sounds good. Right. It sounds, yeah, it sounds good. Ross, I was just going to say that I was redoing my budget, and because of COVID, it went up 20%. So, yeah, just that's all I wanted to say. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, I, I'll just, I'll do a breakdown of COVID if you want. By the way, Joe, I'm very impressed with <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Nicole, your Imogen Award, that's very impressive too. Yeah. So Thank you. Just, just Thank FYI. You. Uh, no, it, it's like our COVID compliance officer was $2,000. Uh, the PPE kits was about $3,000. We had to do COVID tests. We tried to get free ones. There's a site called Curative curative.com out in, you know, where I live in LA. Um, but for the main actors, we, we paid for it and it could be $150 per test, you know, per actor or per person, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, some of the crew took the wrong tests. So then we had to do an emergency <laughs> rather than molecular tests, which are more expensive, but you know, I meant it, so it, it, 
it adds up. Yeah, there you go. We had to wear the N95s. I mean, I, I remember on the first day, I wore one and it was really tight on the ears, like really tight. But, you know, I endured it. But, you know, like at, by the end of that shoot day, I'm telling the COVID compliance officer, can I have that other mask that my script supervisor is wearing? It looks so much more comfortable. And it is on the on the face. Uh, it doesn't wrap around the ears. It just wraps around the head. But it, it is tighter on, on the mouth. But I found out found that to be much more comfortable. And then because, uh, you know, there's uh, – so, Nicole, you probably realize there's zone A and zone B. And then there's zone C. Which is zone A is Crazy. actors, makeup artists, anybody who's interacting with the actors, and you know actors can't wear a face mask or a face shield unless the scene calls for it, right? So let's say I have to go on set and talk to them. Um, I so I, I get a, a red wristband and I'm zone A basically, and then I have to wear this face shield. I'm, I'm surprised, Angela, you didn't bring up that photo of me with the face shield on. <laughs> There's a face shield and a face mask, and I'm, I'm talking to my actors. And, you know, it's it's very interesting because um, just like when you wear a face mask and, and was it sunglasses, it fogs, right? Well, the face mask was starting to fog, and I'm looking at Video Village, and I'm going, I kept looking like this because I, I, I couldn't see, you know, I couldn't see the screen, so I had to kind of like, you know, look out of the side of my eyes. It was very interesting. <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, I don't know if I'd want to do it again. Honestly, COVID is, uh, it, it's something. And the Screen Actors Guild was very strict because we went with the ultra low budget mm -hmm. agreement, not the short film, because we're trying to make this commercial, you know, kind of like what Joe's doing, to be honest, you know, um, uh, what, what am I, you know, I, I love, I went to USC, so, you know, I, I, you know, grow up, you know, idolizing George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, just their blockbusters, and, and basically how they, they were able to do merchandising, which is really what, you know, made, like, Lucas a lot of money is merchandising. It's not really the films well, or any of that. Russ, it's toys. Russ, I would like right. you to actually, can you hear, i like you to touch a base, uh, going to USC, um, going, you went there for filmmaking, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. critical um, studies. That, that's that's quite unique. Going um and that whole experience. Um, tell us about the prestige of coming out such a, one of the top uh, film film universities in the world. Um, who are some of your teachers, or what are some of your experiences? What are the what are the some of the highlights that that benefited you directly that allowed you to come and get into um into you know into into to where you're at now well the usc name obviously helps i mean there's there's no denying it. it's a very expensive school and you know <laughs> I, I had i had uh i had parents and you know they they were able to supply basically you know but um but um you know uh, I, I remember this uh was it two professors um is it actually three professor mcpherson who had these very like 60s looking nifty glasses, Professor Boyd, that was international, I think. And then Professor Casper, who did the Hitchcock studies. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. And actually, no, there was one more. Um, Leonard Moulton was a professor <laughs> and he did the four stars. I, I don't know. I, I, I grew up, you know, looking at his book. This is when, you know, he still collected, you know, physical books. This is a Leonard Moulton's four star scale book. But anyway, so I called him Professor Moulton. It was very interesting. But yeah, it's, um, you know, they, it's especially like the Hitchcock class with Professor Casper. You know, I think the Hitchcock family, he's the only one that's able to teach that class. At least that's what it was 20 years ago when I was, you know, you know, I, I graduated in 2000. So, you know, who knows what what it's like today. Have you so after you graduated and over so it's been 20 years. How long have you been filmmaking? Uh did you would you say professionally as far as really diving in and, and, and doing this? Well I, I directed um so I, I did uh several short films when I graduated and one of them was called Girl with Gun. It's like an action short. And this is back when I was I don't know 25, 26. And it it, it got into quite a lot of places like uh you know, Comic-Con, uh, you know, San Diego Comic-Con. Um, it, it just, you know, it, it just did the rounds. And just FYI, my, the, the, the short film I did before that was a disaster. <laughs> it was awful. 
it was like, I'm glad I learned that lesson and I'll never do it again. Kind of awful. <laughs> like, I don't want to talk about it awful. I'm um, talking about is there it other professions? Don't, Please don't look at it. I'm not going to even name the name of that. But anyway, so Girl with Gun is the one where I learned my lesson. And that's the one that, you know, basically got me on the map, if you want to call it that. Uh, I met my a future feature film producer. So I've directed five feature films. And my producer's name is Howard Nash. And I happened to meet him at a chance meeting at a sunset strip bar, a bar on the sunset strip, you know, and it's through a, another director friend and the director's like, Hey, you got to meet this Howard guy. Yeah. There's Howard right there with Angela. Hi. So uh, Howard's the one with the glasses and, and the goatee. And um, so it was just a chance encounter, you know, um, my friend Tomax is like, Hey, yeah, you, you want to meet this Howard guy? I'm like, okay. So I went there, just had a drink, you know, it was back in like 2004 or something. And he's like, yeah, let's stay in touch, you know, let's see what happens. Anyway, so I showed him Girl with Gun. That's what happened like two years later. And because of that, he offered me uh, to direct a film called PJ. And PJ, uh, the lead actor in PJ was the late John Hurd, who was the dad in Home Alone. He was my lead actor <laughs> in my first feature, which I happened to direct in New York, by the way. So I actually, uh, we directed very close to the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was such a surreal experience because, you know, and he, it's not just him. I mean, because of John Hurd, there was Robert Picardo of Star Trek Voyager and uh, he was Wonder Years and The Howling and you name it. He's been in a lot of stuff. Uh, first time I worked with Bob and this, I've worked with him six times now. Um, you know, had Glynis O'Connor, had Eddie Malavarca, Vincent Pastore from The Sopranos, uh, Hallie Kate Eisenberg. Uh, she was like the Pepsi girl. <laughs> That's how I remember her. So, you know, it was this, this big star studded cast. And I was 29 years old, never directed a feature. And I was basically, uh, uh, I can't do any profanity, right? So I was uh, pooping myself. Pull it there out. We there we go. I was pooping myself there, if that's the <laughs> PC way to say it. No, I, it was it was scary. I was very nervous. You know, I, I was I, I live in L.A. I was living out of my suitcase for like three weeks um, back in it was like December 2006 to January 2007. Uh, it was a very surreal experience. But it seems uh, Howard and the investors are happy with me. And then I did another one called Chasing the Green. And this one had uh, had William Devane, who was directed by. Alfred Hitchcock himself. I mean, that that was very surreal to direct Bill Devane. Um, you know, I, I grew up watching this guy, you know, whether, and I, I saw Nicole, you're on uh, 24, right? I was looking. Up. I was. <laughs> so Bill Devane was also on 24, right? As the, mm -hmm. he became the president, uh, but he yeah, was, eventually like, he was right. Fans, or, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, anyway. So, you know, it just, for me, it was just surreal to direct Bill Devane, you know, because he's just, he's an icon, you know? Um, and I remember my producer, he it was like, I was, I was, I remember I was on the I-95, I think. And my producer called me and go, Hey, Russ, I'm going, what? He goes, we have a chance to get William Vane. I'd be like, that's great. Okay. But we only have a six day window and he has to keep his goatee. I'm like, that's fine. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Sign him on. And that's how that happened. So that was, that was, that was very surreal. And then, um, you know, because of that, then I did my third one called The Legends of Nathaya, and I had Robert Picardo in the main role. Then I did one called Occupants, and Occupants is the one that really kind of took off for me. Um, it, it's uh, when it won, it won at, uh, was it, uh, do you know Shriekfest? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it won the best sci fi feature at Shriekfest in 2016. And I was shocked because that film was like a $40,000 budget that we raised on Indiegogo. And it was up against this other film called Telios. And I think they changed the name for distribution. But that one was like a million dollar film. And I'm not going, no, nah, this is not going to happen, you know. So when they called that, that just it just shocked the heck hey, out of me. I was going to say the other that, that, that budget doesn't determine much if you actually think about it. Budget really, it, it just shows me that budget really isn't like the main holy grail of how a film's going to turn out. There's way more yeah, that goes. No. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I saw Telios. I was, I actually own it because I, I wanted to see what my competition was. 
<laughs> I, it's it's a good film. It actually is a very good film. So you know, I mean, I. I mean, I, I'm not. A, I'm not the judge that judges that so category. What I, what I see here is that we all, we all, uh, we all took the leap and we all jumped off the cliff together, all four of us, at our different points of our career, to go create and do what we had to do, and we're all film. We we've all won, you know, several awards for the different work that we put out there. You know, the goods, the bad, the, you know, whatever the views are and stuff like that. You know, within the cities that can appreciate our work, we have done, you know, done very well. Um, and, and like, I would like to, you know, uh, Joe, I know that, that Billy has won some awards and you've won some other awards also. What are some of the recent ones that you've won? Um, I actually received, uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, I actually received an award at Shockfest. I won Best Cinematic Universe. That was really exciting. It was like the, yeah, it's a, basically the universe can, it's like the umbrella over everything I've done as far as my career. It's like, and Billy, that was cool. And too. also Billy, he, the creep, the Billy as a, as a, as a new character, what was the one that he won recently? He won, he, well, he was actually a finalist for, um, Best Film Monster, I believe. <laughs> Okay. Like that. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's, there's yeah, Billy. Yeah. That little doll is creepy as hell. <laughs> creepy. I'm telling you. I swear to God. Try, yeah. You know what? Can you imagine having that little thing and you know, going into the room with the twins? Well, no. I mean, like, what would they No. <laughs> I don't know. The twins would literally kiss it. I'll be honest. I don't even like being by myself in a room with that thing. It's no. Too, and I made it. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole. What um yeah. with sleeping with fishes? That's your feature film. Your that was with HBO or Stars, right? HBO. Okay. Yeah, it was it's an interesting story though. They rejected it the first time out, and I gave them a raw copy. And I waited uh, till we were you know final uh, on post, and I had an, a better uh, version to send them. And I went back and I got ignored. And then I tried again, and finally, I think they just felt bad for me, and they're like, "Okay, we'll take the call," and um, and we were able three days later to negotiate a deal. But also at that time, Gina, the lead actress, was on her way to uh, a rise of fame with Jane the Virgin, and I think that got the interest going too. Was that you know she had some traction? They wanted to piggyback on that, and so we were able to make a deal, which was really helpful. Um, because it's really impressive to have the call letters, but at the same time, when you're trying to make a return on your investment, it's tricky because they own you for streaming. You cannot stream elsewhere. So you're locked in for two years. And then when you try to go to other platforms, you're kind of been there, done that. They don't want to have something that's already been sort of saturated. Um, but yeah, sorry, I went into a circle on that one. <laughs> Would you say that you were premature on the first time that you turned it in? Do you think you should have waited or, or did you, were you, was it ready to I, go out? I don't think I was premature. I think um, I, it didn't change the story. I mean, other than color correction and maybe a couple extra songs in the background, um, it didn't really change much. I think it really came down to not so much having a better final product, but really having uh, an actor that was on the rise. I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not taking away from the project itself, um, but I think that had a lot to do with it. I, I don't think... Had Gina not been going forward, it might have been a harder fight, even with a fully done product. Okay. So, sense? Joe, Luan, um, what, what do you find? Uh, how do you know when you're done with your product? When you, when, when do you know to say, "Hey, it's ready to go out for uh, to the world"? At what point do you stop? Because you, the way you do things, you ultimately have full control on everything that you do to the end, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. For majority of the time, yeah. Um, I will say though, with like the Immortal Wars, it was till they took it away from me. They're like, you need to stop. Like I, I always found something I wanted to fix. It wasn't ever perfect. So even to, and I'll be honest, even to watching it now, I, I see there and I'm just like, it's not perfect. It's not what I wanted 100% of it. Mm -hmm. But you have to then put your business hat on and be like, now you need to sell this. You need to go because you can't work on this project for so long. You know, it's, and there's many times where I want to go back. I was like, well, what if I do like a, an alternate version, go fix what I wanted to fix and jump back in time. And, and now it's like, you gotta, 
be be proud of what the final product is move on even though if you don't want to it hurts but mm -hmm. let that baby go and then start getting the next one going um, but to me it was a struggle for for a few the first few films it was a struggle for me to to let it go the cool thing with me is when when it comes to the films i've done all my all my deals have been with streaming and dvds as far as my blu-rays i own the rights to my all the films for blu-ray so with that, I went back and like remastered all my features, and now it's being released how I feel comfortable on Blu-ray. Yeah. Let, let's talk about this a little bit more. Um, it is about being perfect. Uh, here we are. You know, we have the world stacked against us in, in many regards. Uh, you know, looking at it from a, a smaller point of view, but we're all trying to, to accomplish these amazing things. That's almost nearly impossible. I, I would say filmmaking has got to be one of the most difficult. Uh, professions that are out there because you know one as an actor it's not like you just go to get a degree you, you graduate all of a sudden you got people lining up to to hire you as an actor um, when you take that a couple steps further as a, as a writer or a director or a producer it's you know um, you have to create everything and um, out the gates unless unless you're in a position to where everything's already you know handed over to you you we have to work and every aspect to make this film happen and the, and to make a film happen when you're dealing with development and script and sound and actors and casting and communication and, you know, food. I mean, there's all these things, um, you know, we are always needing resources and we, you know, we've, we never truly have all the things we need, even though we do. Um, it takes so much time and energy to get what we, you know, just to make the project happen. To where the co the camera turns on, so at what point, you know, it, it, you know everyone's going to be different. How we how we subjectively approach this for myself being perfect is I do everything I can, and I put the team together, and I just know that um, I just I just trust that with with everyone that I put there and, and and the team that we have. Once the camera starts rolling, everyone's going to do the best job they can. We're going to try to have everything that we need. By the time, you know, for that scene as it's rolling and sometimes things roll in at the last moment and all that. But perfect for me is, is being able to to get to that point and finishing. Um, after that, of course, just like you said, Joe, uh, you know, we always look back and different things we can do. But, you know, uh, I've taken so much stress and weight off myself. It's just like, you know, it's just saying, you know what, I'm going to be I'm going to allow myself to be happy with this. And mm -hmm. this is what I can do. And if there was something more I could do, I, I would have done it. So it's okay for this, to, you know, for American Warfighter, that's my directorial debut. And uh, it, you know, we did that, you know, it came out on Netflix uh, just about a year, a year, year and a half ago, I guess. Um, that was a big step. You know, there's American Warfighter right there. Um, and it has opened up so many, you know, it has, it has led me to where I'm able to, to be where I'm at now, which is, you know, in all in steps, but, so for me, um, letting to our listeners, for me, being perfect is doing everything I can and doing, you know, not doing everything I can and, and, and helping guide the team that we have put together to do what they can, helping everyone assist and you go out and do it. And that, when your final product, that's perfect. So when you see American Warfighter, it's perfect. It, it, it couldn't be anything more. We did, we did our, our blood, our sweat, our tears, time. Time is the one thing that we, you know, you never get back, you know, you can spend money, this and that, but it's the time. So um, from my perspective, what's the most important thing is, is having fun and adventure on all the productions now. That's what Rocket Pig is. It's, uh, you know, we're going to show up, we're going to turn the cameras on, everyone's going to be there. And now what's more important is like, I look back at America Warfighter, when I look back at Obscure, I say, hey, we had fun and we had adventure, you know, or, or did everything we could to achieve that. So with that long-winded explanation, Nicole, what's perfect for you? And Russ, what is what is perfect for you? Um, for me, perfection really comes down to making sure I have the right team. Um, I can only control so much. I've learned over the years uh, what not to do, what to do. But the one thing that is vital is really making sure there's a strong understanding with your crew more than anything. Um, and, and down to cater, you know, whoever's doing the uh, craft services. I just, I have worked with a lot of people that have incredible names.
that have zero work value and ethic. And I think I'm a workhorse. I am, Jerry, you know me, I'm funny, I'm free bird, like whatever, whatever. I'm not strict about certain things, but once I'm on set, it's a go. And I just, I don't want drama. I don't want whining. I don't want to hear about how, you know, people complaining about the food, like just do your job. Let's all be happy that we're working and let's move on. That's not a good picture. I was mad that day. What was that? I said, it's okay to be mad. Yeah, we, we have good days. We have bad days. What's, uh, you know, it's all. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I just, you know, people say, oh, as a woman, is it really important for you to work with other women as a, as a, as a Latina? Is it important to have other Latina? I just want good people. I don't care. I just want people who get on set, want to call action, we're good to go, can't control the helicopters, we can't control the planes, we can't control the weather, but we can't control who we are and what our goals are. And I just, I like to work with teams that know that it's grueling hours, knowing that it's low budget, um, or, you know, if it is, and knowing that um, at the end of the day, we all want the same result. We want to have a good product that we can all use to use on a platform to get us up to the next level. Russ, perfect. So, in my in my in my book, uh, there is no perfect, but I try to strive for perfect. I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, I I don't know about uh, about you, Joe, and you, Nicole, and even you, Jerry, but I I don't like to watch my previous films once I'm done with them, because I only see the errors and I only see the flaws. And it's very difficult for me. So once I'm done, I just move on. And I just, you know, I'm happy with what I'm done. There, there's my face mask photo. There we go. <laughs> that, that's, that's me, COVID Russ. There you go, COVID <laughs> Russ. Yeah. It was a very, very, uh, I actually like that look because you don't get to see my face. So, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, like, like Nicole was saying, um, it's about the team. I always say like uh, team occupants, team uh, staycation, which was the one I just filmed uh, because it's, it takes the team. It, it's, I, I view, you know, the cast and the crew as family, you know, and uh, yeah, I love to have fun on set. And of course, you know, we need to get the shots, but yeah, if you don't have a good time, then what's the point, you know, it's like, there's no movie magic, um, you know, and people get mad at each other. I've been on a film set when I, you know, when I was first starting out, I was like interning and it, it, it just, it, nobody liked each other. You know, all the different departments hated each other. I remember on like, I don't know, the third or fourth day of the feature, the grips, they just left. They left, they left the production, you know, and they didn't even tell the producers. They just left. I'm wow. going, okay. And this film had some stars like Michael Ironside or Claudia Christian. And I'm going, uh-huh, that, that's interesting. But from an experience like that, then, you know, I, I on my film, I want people to, you know, just, you know, uh, have a good time, get along. We're family. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, you know, there's going to be little arguments here and there. I mean, it's not like it's perfect, you know. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you you plan as much as possible, you know, like for this new film staycation, we had like two months of prep, which by the way, wasn't still wasn't enough. Uh, you know, I, I have horror stories of, you know, trying to get air filtration units on the very <laughs> last day. So we can get SAG clearance. It was ridiculous. We had 31 minutes from being shut down by SAG clearance. It oh was, my gosh. Just ridiculous. Dude, but yeah. let's, let's, let's share a little bit here. Uh, what are some of the craziest things as producers that we've had to overcome like things that are the, the, the this like like what was the hardest things you had to overcome let's let's do a couple say like two one or two things so uh, if like so well let's say uh like my second feature chasing the green about two three weeks into the shoot my producer's like russ you got to combine two shoot days into one and i'm like okay <laughs> and we ended up doing it but yeah that's not a conversation you know that i wanted to have but it turns out we were we, we were fine it was like this lawyer's office scene and then there's like uh so so the main two leads of you know my that that feature was uh jeremy london and ryan hurst and it was them as children so we used the same house to film the lawyer scene and the you know the, the 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 flashback scene back to mm. the 80s 
and we just combined it. So, you know, I, but yeah, when you, when you hear a story, when, you know, your producer tells you to do that, that, that is kind of, you have to think outside the box, but then my latest example was uh, two Air Fridays ago where I was on the phone pretty much the whole day trying to get SAG to clear my production. Oh. So we don't, we didn't get shut down the next day. What about you, Joe? Fun. Um, For me, I will say uh, for my film, The Immortal War is the first one. It was our like most expensive set. The entire cast was going to be there. It was our biggest, most, biggest. Uh, the scene was just like, it was everything. It had to be perfect. And that morning, I ended up shattering my ankle and my toes. And I still had to bring it. Literally, that's that morning. And you I kept couldn't working the whole day, right? 24 hours. I was literally hopping around on a broken ankle, and I finished everything I had to do. And then I took care of that. Bless your heart, man. That's, yeah. that's who Joe Lujan is. That's a great example of Joe. Yeah, know. worst worst pain in my of my life. Um, well, before what happened to me this year, but yeah, that was bad. That was really bad, and I still had to had to do it. Everything was paid off. Everything was there was no canceling. That wasn't a question at all. So, wow, yeah. wow. Your ankle's fine now. I hope. Yeah, I broke it two more times after that. Same one, but yeah, because of wow. this. Because of this guy right here, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. What What about What about you, Nicole? I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, one of the hardest thing as a producer wearing producer director hat um, on Sleeping with the Fishes was we had an intern that because um, we couldn't we didn't pay for a payroll, so we were doing payroll ourselves. And my intern um, decided that she was going to outright pay all of our vendors um, before returning equipment, everything. So I was really big on paying my crew weekly. I don't like, you know, I want everybody to feel that they're walking away with something. And it was a Thursday and I paid everybody on Friday. And when I went to make the payments and cut the checks, I had about $22 left in my account because she had paid out everybody. And I spent the entire day liquidating my own money, calling the investors that had put monies in and begging them saying, I will, I will return your money right away. This is, I'm just, I have no money. And I clearly I fired her, but at the end of the day, I mean, she just, she paid, she paid everybody out. And I don't know how I managed to do it, but I managed to get enough money. I think it was like 47,000 just to pay my cast and crew. I just couldn't, it just wasn't, it was wrong for me to, I can't, I'm when it comes to money, like I, everybody deserves their due. And I didn't want to tell a casting crew that we didn't have the money because we were two weeks in and we had one more week left and I just wanted to go out with a bang. And so that was a, that was a big hiccup. I mean, to sit wow. there and stress about how you're going to pay people and to try to teach this young girl that you don't pay out your vendors in full before the production's closed. <laughs> you just don't. So that wow. was a big one. That and the fact that we shot one day when um, the, Navy ships were coming into the port in Manhattan. And so one of those days we were shooting and it was a big, intense outdoor scene. And all you hear is eh, eh, like all the ships going by. <laughs> Thank you for that. You're fired. <laughs> so, wow. But see, after, awesome. can I say something real quick? After hearing all these stories, it's kind of like as filmmakers ourselves, to me, it's like we go through so much shit. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Jerry. I said it again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, but then it's worth it at the end. It's like, but it always, that, that's the way I see it. It's like you stress and you're, you're, if you're in the middle of that, you're kind of like, how in the world are we going to get through this? How are we going to fix this? And then at the end, some way or another, it works out. And then you're just yeah. like, oh, wow, we really just go, went through that and we got through it. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it you know works well. This is a perfect example. We're all still here. We're telling the stories. Um, yeah. This is something that has been very monumental in the recent, in, like say within the last two years again, I'd say. And even with Obscura, no matter what is happening, I know that there's a there, um, there's the other side of everything. Even though we're caught up in the tornado and the chaos of whatever crazy things, because producing and, and filmmaking, there's going to be acts of God. They're going to stop, you know, try to stop you. But yeah. the 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 whatever we have inside us is become so resilient. I mean, we can 
get thrown in the in the ring with Tyson, Mike Tyson, you know, at his at his prime, and somehow survive and it. knock yeah. him out, you know, yeah. and send him back to the corner. Um, yeah. No disrespect to Mike Tyson, he's actually fighting again here pretty soon. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to share a couple horror stories that I had um, in my career, um, some recent and some from the from the earlier days. Uh, so uh, let's say uh, an American warfighter. Uh, I had this filmmaker and we were friends. We had met on the set and he, he, he had wanted to be, I had already produced uh, I think like 10 or 11 feature films at this point. Now I was doing my directorial debut and he really wanted to, to come on board in any capacity he could. He had done some short films and stuff and I'm, I'm not here to talk bad, but I'm just, this is it's to share some of the things that we come, you know, um, that we have to deal with. So, um, he, he wanted to come on board. So I was like, okay, cool. And then he says, I want to be an actor in there. So I was like, okay, cool. So here's what we'll do. You come on board as a producer. Um, these, here's two areas that I need help with, you know, like say wardrobes with, uh, with terrace and also and sound. You, you take care of those two areas. I'll take care of everything else. Cool deal. And oh, and he gets to be an actor. So anyway, we, uh, we, we, we get out into a remote location. It's six hours you know, from you know, actually in Goldfield and we're shooting out there. Um, and, and he, he gets to be one of the, the you know, a, a very prominent supporting cast, but we're able, you know, we're having to move fast in our shooting schedule. So the first day that we're out there, um, we're, uh, you know, we're able to film out all his scenes, you know, all in one day. And then um, he was also out there with, uh, with the sound, our sound guy and all the sound equipment. So the next morning, uh, you know, we still have like 10 days to shoot. Well, the next morning, like at 530 morning, they're rolling out. And I'm like, whoa, where are you guys going? We're getting ready for breakfast and getting ready to go out there. And he's like, oh, sorry, there's an emergency. I have to take off. And I'm like, what? And, oh. and, you know, and, and so and they couldn't leave the, the sound guy because he was responsible for the sound guy detail. So we lost my wow. a professional sound team um, and my producer after the first day because, you know, and they had an emergency to go. Oh, you know, wow. over the next couple of days, we shot. We saw that there there was uh, pictures coming up in Las Vegas of them you know, having a good time in Las Vegas and stuff, and other producers and people on the team are showing me, and it was just really disheartening. Um, which is, uh, you know, so we we put all our sound with all our filmmakers. We put our sound kits together, and we got it done. And Logan Byers, uh, he's one of our producers with uh, with Rocket Pig, who has since now um, been nominated for Emmys. Uh, with his sound, which is uh, awesome, but he saved our butt. Um, that was that was a big blow to me, and it took a long time for me to really, you know, to, to really get over that. And I have, you know, this is again just telling story. Um, you know, you know who you are out there. It's okay. You know, water under the bridge. We move on. Um, but anyway, that that was a big one. Um, another one was let's see. Uh, Oh, okay. Like even, even like recently, you know, even with Obscura, there was incredible challenges. Um, we put Obscura together um, because of COVID and a lot of people wanted to come together and make this film. And Joe, you, I mean, you, you know this, you know everything that I'm saying here, but um, you know, we wanted to, people wanted to come together and do something instead of sitting on our butts for the next, you know, next six months or whatever, or a year, however long COVID takes. So we started building something really small Joe, myself, and our cinematographer Kilo, we went out and start. We did some test shoots, came up with a cool teaser, which uh, each you guys can check out on RocketPig.com, and that. And from there, there's a picture of Joe and Kilo right there. This was oh, what a great, great picture of you guys. Um, Joe, of course, our director, on there, and let's see. Okay. Huh? Oh, oh gosh, Nicole, do you need to go? <laughs> Nicole. <laughs> oh, sorry. Nicole's got a family oh, and her kiddos and stuff, so she's gonna have to take off. No, I feel bad. I just I was just telling Angela like I got 30 left in me before I start to oh, fade no, out. That's cool. That's cool. Before I see now moving. Here. I'll, I'll just finish up <laughs> with the story real quick. Anyway. No, I feel horrible, guys. I'm so sorry. It's just it's later here and yeah, my Nic kids get Nicole's up. Nicole's on the East Coast and she I have to schedule a time just to talk to her or she schedules a time that she can call me when she's free. That's how busy she is. Just so busy. <laughs> um, you know what? Anyway, it's not even, it's, it's okay. Um, basically what happens is, uh, uh, 
one of the things is we have a, a limited resource or with limited resources. We're doing a night shoot. We're understaffed and we're on top of a mountain of, uh, of shale and seven different levels of, uh, of a vacant mining facility with all these crazy elements. And there's also, you know, there's, there's wind and there's all this, you know, there's, it was the most difficult evening, okay. night shoot, or not, the, the most difficult and challenging and taxing moment of my film career in 19 years. And I'm the most, here I am at the most, um, at a time of my career and in, in Joe's career, we were, we're the most, uh, we're, we're the most gifted, the most experienced, you know, throw anything at us. Night. We've been there, that seen it all. Rough. And man, yeah. it, it was nothing. We had flat tires, flashlights going out, generators that weren't working. And we're doing a night shoot. And it was, it was incredibly so difficult. And I, 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 from that point on, I didn't sleep for three days for the rest of the next two days because it was so difficult. And I could never, if I slept, I wasn't going to be able to catch up on everything that we had to do. But what happened was what, the next morning when everyone's getting ready for breakfast and getting ready to go again, um, what it taught me is that we didn't give up. We were still there. We got everything that we needed. Here's our directors. We have Grant James on the left, myself in the middle, and we have Joe Lujan on the right. And what what a what a team, what an experience. We're going to have, um, we're going to have Joe back also, and we're going to get Grant on there. We're going to share about, you know, um, having different directing styles and teammates going on there. There's no egos. You know, there's a, there's another uh, picture of us. I think that's Roxy, our, our makeup gal. Um, and Lachlan, our, our writer, producer. And Thomas, our uh, director of photography, is over there, too, with Kilo. Um, yeah, so, um, man, so what it taught me was that the team stuck together. Uh, we didn't we didn't give up on each other. And if there were any weak links or anything like that, which people have good days and bad days, you know, other people have opportunities to rise to the occasion and rise to step up. And there's as long as we're able to fill everything that we need, we keep moving on. And the workflow kept on going. And man, there's some people that jump ship. Um, and you know, and and you know, again, even though I'm the most experienced and have the biggest, you know heart and excited to do this you know there's still there's still punches that come in but you learn to uh you know however we choose to navigate through that um and the better you know being present i always say being present and being available and ready and as long as you're doing everything that you possibly can there's nothing that anyone can say or do you know once you have that confidence that can really it can really jar you too much to where you get off your path or you get wobbly or something, you know, it, it affects you in a sense here or there. But when you, when you get to the point in your, in your career or life, when you're in the pilot seat, this is, I say you're in the pilot seat and you know how to operate all the buttons and you have your, you have your, you know, you have all the, all your, uh, all your people in the plane and you're guiding them and you're guiding yourself, man. There's, there's very little that can, that can happen to where you're just, you, you're just, you know, knocked, completely out for the count and uh that's you know i guess that's a good way to kind of end with this session here this off it's all worth it at the end man it's all worth it at the end yeah and then you you stick to it it's it's all worth at the end it really is and anyone who wants to get involved it's like i i don't know how many times i ran into i didn't know if i could do this i don't know if you should stop I don't know if I should figure something else out, but it's like, no, like my heart set on it. Like it's worth it. Keep going. Anyone who wants to get into it, just keep on creating and shoot something one day and, and, and share it with friends and family. Let's see what they say. Then use what you learn from that and incorporate that in the next project and just keep on creating, keep on creating stuff. That's the way I just did it for years. I'm still doing it now. I don't know. I'm, I'm working on like five different projects at the same time right now. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> Amazing. It's so Nicole, you can uh, you can go ahead and we'll, we'll say bye to Nicole now, so she can get to her kiddos and kind of jump just off of here. More like bad. <laughs> but thank you, don't, thank you, Jerry. Not, I, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on board. Thank Nicole, you for having um, me. And I'll I'll connect all of us here too, so we can all kind of help too. out. Um, and you and I have some more work to do on your current project, so yes. let's let's plan. Um, Get a hold of me when you're available, and we'll go over some more of what we were talking about. 
Um, and you yeah. know, have a great night's sleep. Thank you for coming on. Thank you guys so much. Joe, pleasure meeting you. Russ, pleasure meeting you. And uh, yeah, that's that was me. You know, <laughs> that, that looks really heavy. <laughs> it is really heavy. And actually, they made me take it out of my luggage at the airport because they didn't they didn't believe that it wasn't something more serious. They thought, they thought it was a weapon. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, when I first got it, I was like, oh my god, I wasn't prepared for the weight. But um, yeah, <laughs> now it's just collecting dust. But thank you guys so much. I look forward to watching your projects as well and keeping in touch. And Jerry, again, thank you for having me. Bye, Bye, Nicole. Later. Guys. Later, Gomez. Gomez, she's out. There she is. Uh, oh, anyway, guys, by the so way. It's, it's three of us. Yeah. Oh, on a side note, uh, I'm a big cat fan, and I, I think you two are also, right? I, would, yeah, I was wanting cats. to say that. Yeah, I think I got <laughs> I, 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 I'm, all, I'm team kitties, is what I call it. In fact, <laughs> I made a new friend on my walk today named Whiskers. <laughs> it just happened to just come up to me. It's a beautiful black cat. So, no, I love cats. I even in staycation. Oh yeah, there, there's a cat in the photo in in the film. So yeah, I definitely nice. uh, cat get cat fan. So <laughs> yeah, no cats. Yeah, my boy. I've had him for years. He's literally oh. looking at me. He loves the camera. He's like always around me. That, Jerry that and the lion. The lion behind you. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. In fact, Joe, that that picture in the background, the lion, um, the the western that we're doing, um, that I, I mean, that you know about that we're doing, you and I. Yeah. But uh, um, there's a story with that lion exactly. Oh, yeah. And so when we're in Oklahoma, going over uh, just recently, going over some of the storylines and stuff like that, um, there was a um, there was a lion in the background and a big old portrait beautiful oil painting and it, I, I got the idea that this there's a lion from lion the witch in the wardrobe yeah and his that, that character the lion's name's like aslan or something like that yeah something like that and i think it, yeah and and in the and i didn't know that and i know of it but i didn't know that i wouldn't have know, known that unless they said that but someone was saying a sentence and then they said aslan as as land in a sentence but not the yeah. name Aslan. I know this is going to be real confusing. Anyway, I like the name Aslan and Aslan. And so I said, that's going to be one of the characters of the main good guys in the movie. And yeah, anyway, that's there's, there's no way to explain the way that I felt and what it means. But there's a line back there. Good for you. Yeah. I, got, I got my, my Taurus right here. My, my bull. Since I'm, I'm born in April. So I got I got the bull there and yeah. yeah. Be living on your own, having a cat definitely it's not lonely when you have a cat. <laughs> no. He becomes your best friend. He's my child. He's seen the good so, times and the bad times. Very true. And uh is is Leon with you right now? Is he Yeah, he's right here. Leon, come here. Oh. He's literally right here. He's like watching me. He talk Russ, this cat talks all come here. the time. Come here. Let's see if let's see if he can hear me. Yeah. Can you Leon? Leon. Oh. Leon, where's Leon? I love Leon. <laughs> there he is. Oh, uh, Leon. <laughs> Hi, That's so Leon. Awesome. Yeah, he's like That's my so best awesome. friend. Yeah, he's everything. Aww. He's my baby. He's my baby. So cute. <laughs> so, hey, guys. So what I would love is, uh, Ross, get a hold. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll make sure that Angela puts us all in touch. But, um, you know, get a hold of Joe. Joe is... Uh, it's quite amazing in a whole bunch of different areas uh, with marketing and public um, um, pu marketing and branding and stuff like that. He's, he's the best oh, of the best. Yeah. He really is. No, I, 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 I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. And done. Joe, show, um, you can send him that picture of all the covers that you've done. You get that over yeah. to, uh, yeah, yeah. to Russ. Send that. All the artwork you see on everything. I do all the artwork myself. Yeah. Your posters are amazing. Thank you. I, I yeah. Just, uh, I, yeah. I was going to ask you did that. Now I know it's you. Yeah, right yeah. there. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Thank I, you. I, I, I did. So you both worked on Obscura, is that correct, or yeah. was it just because yeah, are, the, the location is producers. amazing? That's in Vegas, or that's yeah. in Nevada? It's in Nevada. Nevada is a that, great, that's a very place. amazing location. Yeah, no, it's it's. I was on set yesterday, and we were filming in the forest, forty-five minutes from my place. It's like dense forest with pine trees, and you wouldn't even imagine. It's snowing up there. It's insane right now. Yeah. 
It's really nice. Uh, that's and that's you amazing. Have the and, yeah, it's a real nice place too. The locations out in Nevada are phenomenal. That's insane. It's well, insane. I am assuming filming in Nevada is easier than filming where I am. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. <laughs> it's a lot easier out here. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, and you have you beautiful locations, but but I just on a personal note, uh, the the uh, Vegas is closed right now because of COVID. Well, again, actually, or? what they did was a midnight tonight. Actually, midnight tonight. There's a there's going on to a lockdown of I think they said twenty five percent capacity anyway, something uh, like that. something like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's starting to get bad over here as well. Unfortunately, well, was, my, my um, hometown right now is completely shut down. I'm from El Paso, Texas, so they're not doing so well out there. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, the vaccines can't come soon enough. Yeah. That's, that's my it's like we hope things are getting better, but then we get pushed back. You know what I mean? It's like all we got to do is keep on going and keep on, on, on working and hope that, you know, we can get to some sense of normalcy when it comes to all this craziness. So have you just also a, a personal question? Have you both taken the, the the COVID test up the nostrils? I did, yeah, I did. It was <laughs> not fun. It was the worst. Does it remind you of Arnold Schwarzenegger in Total Recall? Oh my god, like, you know the scene I'm talking about, right? Yeah, exactly. But it's like nostril gets huge, and yeah, no, it was, uh, just think exactly for the crunch. Like, I had envisioned that when it was happening. I'm like. Dude, you can't go any further up there. Stop. Oh, <laughs> like, God. Yeah, that was, yeah, not fun. Not no, fun that, that, that's what it, I tasted my nostrils for a good hour after that, t- <laughs> oh, yeah. after that test. It was yeah. so bad. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah that's not fun. <laughs> anyway, enough well, of those horror stories. <laughs> so, so guys, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, I, I want to thank you both, uh, Russ and, and Joe, for, um, for coming on to Satellites. Thanks so much. And, um, I really appreciate both of you, uh, you know, as, as being uh, pathfinders um, and, and creating your, you know, creating your steps forward. I, I believe this will be an inspiration for others to be able to help encourage them to do the same, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep, uh, let's stay in touch and let's help e- each other move forward. And, you know, as, as, as we come together too, we're going to help out, a, you know, a lot of people and anything that I can do, and be of service to you, uh, to you, Ross. And of course, you know that too, Joe. Yeah. Um, million percent. We're here for each other. I know when I put my dreams together, you guys come on board and help me out and, 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 and help, help me achieve my, my goals. And that goes likewise for you is that we'll come on and, and build our, you know, and, and build a team or whatever you need or resources to help you get forward as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for having you guys. Yeah. Have an awesome evening. Um, enjoy. What's your cat's name, Russ? Well, I, my my cat by it's my friend's cat. Name is Finley. <laughs> One, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm actually Bunyan? just FYI. I'm actually highly allergic to cats. So, so am I. I can't, yeah. Oh, so so yeah. I've got to talk to you because you know yeah. if I could get over the asthmatic attacks and all that, you know, I'd be very Real happy. Quick, to you, I was. Definitely allergic to cat. It was really bad. Yeah. I don't know if my body just got immune to it. I, that I don't get the sense. I mean, if he scratches me or if I put like my face up against his fur or something, then I get really bad. But other than that, okay. no. It, yeah, it, it, so, it went so away. It starts, it starts to rash and itch and all that. So yeah. You know, oh yeah. And then if you get scratched, you get like it, it swells up and yes, it's not, <laughs> that's not fun. <laughs> but it went away after the years. I've had him for. Eight years now. I've had him since he was a baby, a baby baby, and it went away. Yeah. Oh. Well, the only <laughs> cat I have is. Uh... There oh. we go. Here's my cat. <laughs> it looks more like an egg. <laughs> yeah. And Ashley lights up too. I think. Oh. Some. There we go. Oh. Hey, that's pretty cool. Ashley no, kind of looks like a character from a Miyazaki Hayao film. Yeah, it's actually thing. cool. <laughs> Anyway, that's my that's cat. <laughs> guys, you guys have a wonderful night. And, uh, thank, thank you, you too. On the satellites. And uh, Joe, I'll be seeing you very soon, man. Yeah, definitely. All right. All right. Yes. Nice, you, nice, you. Nice, nice to meet you, Joe. Nice to meet you. Thank Bye. you, Expansion. Uh,